Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Welcome, class, to Cosmere Parenting 101. Oh, wait, wrong script. <clears throat> so, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. It is episode 116, and it is August 15th, 2022. So, I'm Amy, and I know this isn't Bill, but he's still here, too. And I am joined, as always, by my academic co-hosts, Jordan and Bill. Hello. Hey. Hello. So before we get started, we want to remind you that the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is not a spoiler-free podcast. Normally, that would mean that if there's something in the Cosmere you haven't read and are worried about hearing spoilers, you might want to go read those first, then come back and join the discussion. We're bouncing all over the Cosmere today, so yeah, it's a very valid concern. For those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube, we'd like to remind you that it's possible for our listeners to interact with us live via chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash innkeepers table. We record episodes of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies every other Monday night starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, so please join us and take an active part of the discussion. The Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. Our show will continue to be free, but if you want to help us out, you can head over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Even pledging a couple dollars each episode really helps us out as we work to improve the show. Our patrons get immediate access to our Discord channel, where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. It's a great community with a lot of great discussions. You will also get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and other good stuff. And I posted about it on our social media, but I put up the second quick six. Quick six. Blah. And so that was available to the patrons about a week early. So if you become a patron then you can get the third one a week early and the fifth and whatever long you want to stick around so it would be great but if you can't then that's just fine um so i don't think we have any new patrons to discover to talk nope. about and jordan you're still on hiatus with the read along yep okay um and i will let so we have bill are you going to do the thing oh that thing the Cosmere thing. thing of the week. It was really quiet. That was really quiet. That was really quiet. Man, it was like the hint of Cosmere thing of the week. Cosmere thing of the week. Total. We'll fix it in I'll do it anyway. Uh, anyway. So, but I, did you want to talk about it, Bill? So this is something that I found uh, on uh, on Reddit, but they sent it to a Twitter page. And what they've done, uh, I can't remember the username. Can you check it? Uh, yes, Saruji. Saruji. So this is basically an animation that they worked on. It's, they said they took it up, took them about a week for the scene of Mistborn where uh, Kelsier is teaching Vin how to use steel pushing and basically teaching her, training Very her. Very appropriate for our uh, parenting episode. Ex- exactly. But it's, it's really cool. It's a fan-made animation, very brief. It's of that scene. I, I'm not comfortable sh- playing it on our yes, stream it because it uh, it it's includes the audio from the audio what's book. it called? Oh, the, is it the Black Piper thing? Uh, or is no, 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 audio? not the Black Piper thing. It's the something audio. The not the audio book, but the what's it called? Oh, the the sound. Oh, the book that has the extra graphic audio. Graphic yes. audio. It has their version of the audio from the book. Yeah, I just have it muted. And so, okay, so people can see the animation that went into it. But it's it's really cool. It's uh, you know, it it's definitely fan made, but it it's still a lot more than I could do. So it's impressive to me. So bravo! Oh, yeah, that's really cool. Well, and it's just so, a great scene. It's an amazing mm-hmm. scene. But yeah, like I said, they've got the audio behind it. So you should check out. We'll have the link in the show notes. You also go go check that out. You should. Yes. So now we're getting to the meat of the stuff. So um, we, we've been bouncing around this idea for 
months and I just finally got around to doing it. I was going to have this be my quick six and then I was like, oh no, this is such a huge topic. I can't, <laughs> I cannot get it into a quick six video. Not unless I'm like, they all have parents. Some of them are good. Some are bad. Yay. We're done. So, um, they don't all have parents. Well, they had anyway. <laughs> they all had parents at one point or another. Whether Fair they enough. were involved is a different story. Um, okay. So for kind of grading the parents and putting them into kind of ranks, I'm, I'm not a psychology major. I'm not a child development major, whatever. I just, I have two children. So we're kind of going from she there. She did stay at a Holly, Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> Um, anyway, but I'm going to use the four different parenting styles that are defined by developmental psychologists. I'm going to get these names wrong. Diana Bomerand and Stanford researchers Eleanor Maccabee and John Martin. Um, so there's the main four. There's permissive, child-driven. So anything the kid wants, rarely gives or enforces rules, overindulges the child to avoid conflict. So this, the, yeah, there's the, the names are fairly self-descriptive. Mm -hmm. um, then there's authoritative so they solve the problems with their kid. They set clear rules and expectations, open communication, and natural consequences. So generally a pretty good one. Then there's neglectful. So uninvolved, little nurturing or guidance, indifferent to the child's social, mm -hmm. emotional, or in behavioral needs. And then there's authoritarian. Parent-driven, set strict rules and punishment, one-way communication with little consideration of the child's social, emotional, and behavioral needs. So permissive, authoritative, neglectful, and authoritarian. Hi, dog. What are you doing? Um, so anyway, I figured we'd kind of go through the parents book by book and then kind of give what we thought they fit into. I already kind of picked what I thought they fit into and then kind of go from there. Cool. So, all right. We're going to start with Elantris because that's the first book. Um, so so are first... we going publication order then, or yeah, well, by, yeah. by series? Yeah, we're gonna go by series. Okay. My throat's rebelling today. Um, so we have first Serene Sereni. I always feel wrong saying the name like that. <laughs> her her dad, the king of Teod, Eventeo, um, mm -hmm. and she had a mom. Her name was Eshin, but she died two years pre Rayad, so we don't know a whole bunch about her mom. If um, it helps. Uh, Sereni was named after his friend Annie. Oh, so it's like Sereni, Annie. So I know, but I look at it and go, Serene. It's just, it's mm -hmm. what my brain does every time, even though I know it's not that. Um, yeah. so it'd be, anyway, a good, I, it'd be a good name uh, over on uh, The Shadows for Silence and the Forest of Hell. <laughs> Serene. <laughs> it would, it would. Serenity, Serene. Um, anyway, so I have him as authoritative. Do you guys concur? Uh, I would probably give him authoritative, yeah. Because I mean, he talks to I'll be honest, to her. I have completely forgotten about him. <laughs> Authoritative is probably the, one of the healthier. It yeah, is. It's ones. looking through them. It's it's pretty much the healthy one because you either have that they don't have any structure and you end up with little brats who become big brats. You have authoritative where you you have good socially rounded, emotionally capable people. You have neglectful where you're neglecting your kid and then you have authoritarian who are like my way or the highway because yeah, I said there's so sort of two everything. different two different negative versions of that because you either could mm -hmm. have the the controlling one or you could have the lawnmower parent yeah i'm not sure where helicopter parents fit into that i think authoritarian, uh, authoritarian. helicopter parents can th the thing is a lot of parents sort of swim through these mm-hmm you know, like they're, they're one sometimes and there's others in other ways. I, I don't know that you, you'll necessarily always have a parent who fits Helico cleanly into yeah. a single Helicopter group. would yeah. fit sort of between authoritarian and permissive. I would say that too. Yeah, because, cause, oh, but, but little Johnny needs such and such. And then like, but I can't let little Johnny ever have any pain or whatever. And so they, yeah. Sometimes you just got to let the kids stick the fork in the electrical socket. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. They won't they won't do that again. <laughs> they'll they'll learn a valuable lesson real quick. Oh, don't Speaking do of, one. you think doing this episode is us sticking a fork in an electrical socket? <laughs> <laughs> um no, it's fine. Um so anyway, but like he's he's not a perfect person. He did steal the crown from Keen, like which I totally forgotten. Kyan. Ke Ke oh, 
goodness. I am going to. Every vowel always long. Well, well, welcome (laughs) to why Jordan doesn't like Elantris. The name Kai Ein, when I heard it in the audio book, I immediately just said, I don't like this book. (laughs) I look at it and I'm like, it's not. Anyway, we're going to move past the names. Um, Anyway, but like he did steal the throne from his brother and he's not a perfect person, but he's really nice to Serene. He helps her become a good um, person. She becomes a. Mm hmm. Oh goodness, she goes and helps deal with other countries and the word is just gone. Um Diplomat. Diplomat, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so she becomes a very good diplomat. Um and then we have like the flip side, we have Ryodin's father. Iodin. Iodon? Anyway, I don't know. And Iodon. he's I his dad. Um he's very <laughs> much authoritarian, I would say. I would probably put him most as authoritarian, yeah. Yeah. A little bit ne- neglectful. Yeah. Was Wasn't he the one who was thing. also in the cult? Yes, yes, he was in the cult. Yes, he was. So, but you then know, there's, it's, you there's lose also points weird... for that. Oh, yeah, that's that's a definite problem. You were going to like sacrifice your son's fiance? Yeah, that's cool. Um, that is going to make Thanksgiving dinner really awkward. <laughs> really awkward. Yeah. Um, but no, like, and... Rayodin purposefully rebels and you know against him because he is so strict and doesn't let him be himself and he's just not a very nice man um and then we had Serene's extended family and they you don't I don't remember a ton of detail about them but like they seem to be pretty authoritative you know the good kind like they their kids were well adjusted they weren't horrible by extended family are you talking about Kayan? yeah Kayan and like and is it mostly just his family? Because it feels like it's more than that. Well, because it's it's, it's his three kids are the ones that we yeah. really see. Okay, I didn't yeah. like those kids. Which is interesting <laughs> because Brandon said if he does a sequel to Elantris, which is a possibility, it'll likely focus on those kids. Yeah, I suspect as after they've grown up a bit. But well, and also yeah. it'll be a very different Brandon who's writing them. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, well, Elantris yeah. tends to have that issue where Serini's a little too about everything and the kids are just a little too precocious and it's just one of these you know he's finding he's finding how to write well i mean he fully admits that in his earlier books especially he didn't know how to write women so he did to his credit he did better than a lot of other fantasy authors oh yeah they had personality they had differences to them (laughs) they weren't just like i'm pretty or i mean or well and 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 again this is Brandon after he's been a parent for several years. He, you know, he yeah. didn't have any kids when he wasn't married when he wrote. Th- this part, this is the other reason I wanted to do this uh, along with Amy, just because we get to see the evolution of the complexity of the parenting as yes. time goes on. And Brandon's, mm-hmm. you know, been a parent. Mm-hmm. So Li- Libra Lita in the chat actually brings up a point that I, I'd forgotten about, but it's like, and she says, or she, I'm guessing it's a she, would Rayad's mom be the passive one? And I kind of noticed this, especially with the earlier books and sometimes with later ones, but mostly with the early ones, that a lot of times it's like the dad is in effect, is is raising the kid and the mom's just dead or not there or not mentioned. And so that bothers me as a trend, just because it means that well, Sometimes but, but it's hard it, it, makes, have more... it makes perfect sense for what we were talking about. If Brandon doesn't know anything about parenting, he knows even <laughs> less about being a mother. So in the early books, it's like the mom ah. is dead because that well, solves my problem. <laughs> the thing is also you compare it to a lot of you know popular stories. I mean, there, there there's a, a trope that Disney princesses don't have parents. Yes. Or Disney Disney heroes don't have parents. And part of that is because that makes them already put puts them into an interesting storytelling position because your parents are safe. Mm-hmm. Your parents help you get through things. And when you don't have parents, suddenly you have to struggle against things without that safety net that some people have. And that support I mean, and, the, and everything I mean, else. Like, yeah, Batman, the most successful oh, yeah, Batman. character Batman ever. Batman would not be Batman. Well, anyway, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just kind of interesting that like all of these moms just keep being dead or not around. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> it's just a little frustrating to see but i mean it's it feels like the norm in a lot of stories too mm-hmm. um anyway but that's that's the ones I, the main ones i remember from elantris but but as the series goes on there tend to be more oh yeah effective parent not, not just more effective but more parents involved 
mm-hmm. in, in their lives. Well, their I mean, lives. it makes sense because he became a parent and then knows how to do it better and write about it and everything else. But it's just, especially in Elantris, and, and then there's a couple other Well, and, and not just him. Uh, also, you know, his friends, his family. You know, he's going to be mm-hmm. active in his nieces and nephews' lives. So oh, it's yeah. gonna, it's gonna, you're going to yeah. get a whole variety to it. Yeah, it, what, the more you experience in your real life, the more you can put into your writing. Um, then we move on to Mistborn, which has quite a few, quite a few more characters. So I started with Kelsey and Marsh. Um, so their dad was a nobleman, their mother was a ska, but she like faked it being a noble noblewoman to keep herself alive for longer. Mm-hmm. And then their dad found out and killed her. So I have that the mother is probably authoritative even if she wasn't a perfect person we don't know a ton about her but she had to be good at some part of parenting if she kept them alive as long as she did yeah even though i don't know that she picked the yeah. greatest I, guy yeah i i don't that. i don't know that we have enough information really yeah to... we don't anyway so i yeah and then their dad is obviously neglectful he didn't know they existed and then when he did he well no he knew they existed mom. he just didn't know that they were ska oh that's true yeah but we don't i don't know we don't know a ton about them either yeah they both came out very uh competent Mm -hmm. yes so she at least taught them skills yeah they had skills and they had morals even if kelsiris are a little bit skewed but he does have a moral code um to a point so, and then we can move on to Vin. So, you guys had some thoughts about Vin, I'm sure. I mean, well, her uh, Vin, her birth father makes it doesn't matter, but because uh, he's well, she's she's nothing but a dead weight for him, right? It, it'd be interesting to see what he would have been like. Honestly, he would have been as authoritarian as they come. I think. I mean, as oh, the yeah, the leader of on. an authoritarian <laughs> yeah. group. Um. I think but, the more more interesting one is Kelsier and Vin because Kelsier refers to her multiple times, especially in Secret History, as his daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the adoptive daughter. They they and, absolutely develop a parent yeah. relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, and and it's very it's very authoritative because I mean he gives that whole speech to where it's like no, like you have to trust me. If you don't mm-hmm. trust me, this won't work. So if you don't trust me, here's your boxings. You can go on your way. And so he he wanted her to bloom into right. whoever she was. And he did a great job of understanding where where am I deficient and trying to get her to people who can cover the other things. Says yeah, that as another parent figure for her. Yeah, she had like that whole the whole crew is basically Honestly, the, Yeah, the whole parents. crew were basically uncles for her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Breeze so is the, the bad uncle who uh, teaches you all the wrong things that you have to have. <laughs> and and Ham is the sort of chaotic uncle who teaches you all the fun stuff. He does, but he still doesn't lead you down. <laughs> yeah, still a good guy. Ham, Ham is the one who just who stirs up a little bit of trouble, sits back, and chuckles to himself because he knows everybody else is just being dumb. And when a fight breaks out, he breaks it up because that's what he's good at. So yeah. But yeah, but I think Kelsier actually showed that he's a, he's a decent parent. Like, yeah. Which is weird, well, given some of his other tendencies. Well, especially yeah. considering the the very end of uh, of the Final Empire. The reason that Kelsier is even there is because Ellen is there. He goes mm-hmm. to save the boyfriend that he doesn't approve of. Yep. Because she loves him, and I'm just yep. like that. That's an impressive thing. I, I've said it before, but um, the Final Empire is. So, so it, it's clearly inspired by Le Miserable. I mean, you you have so many parallels in there. You know, Vin is Cosette, uh, Kelsier is Jean Valjean, um, the, the the French background, and Brandon is a, a big fan of Victor Hugo. So it, it just it all makes sense that there's a lot of Le Miserable in there, and it's the same sort of adoptive parent relationship where it's a person who has a very rough past who that they want to um protect this new ward that they have from but you know kelsey is a little bit more ruthless in the way he he handles things because he ends up putting her in danger oh, yeah. um but of course you know everything that happens at credit shaw that 
that affects the way he sees her and utilizes her. Um, but it, it's it, like I said, it's a very, very Les Miserables style <clears throat> thing. And the parent relationships parallel that very strongly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I had to watch Les Mis like twice to finally get it to click that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are connected. Mm-hmm. By this time I don't know what you're talking about. It's clearly linked to Tang and Top and Gurren Logan. Gesundheit. You can't <laughs> just make up words while we're streaming. I can. And if, you, okay, if you've seen that anime and read Mistborn, look up Mistborn, Tang and Top, and Gurren Logan. There's a picture. You start looking for those parallels, you're going to be shocked. I feel like, are those two different animes? Or is that one anime? That's one anime. Okay. It just I feels think... like two animes because things take a turn in season two. People often like... will just refer to it as Gurren Logan. Yeah. Okay, then Josh has watched part of that. I was very it's confused great. for like, anyway, the, um, the minute I saw it. Anyway. But the other thing I find interesting about Kelsier as a parent is the fact that in some ways it's cut short because he Mm. only gets the one book to be a parent and then he's back to being the lone wolf again as we see in secret history Mm -hmm. he gets one last moment with her and then it's done and it's sort of he has to go back to just being Kelsier again yeah And, And, and it's interesting thinking that relationship really only lasted a single year yeah but it was probably intense but it was it was important and yeah. it was, it influenced both of them very deeply. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kel, uh, he says, it, I can't remember. In, it's in one of the annotations in one. I can't remember if it's the second book or the third book, but he just talks about how Kelsier casts a long shadow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's, yeah. and, and, but the same way at the very end, think of the very end of a uh, secret history mm-hmm. where she returns the kindness and, and gives him one more lesson. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's the thing is they were only together for a year, but because of all the stuff that went on in secret history, Kelsey has been watching her for six. Yeah. So he has seen her growth, even if he didn't see every step of it. Maybe five. That requires math. Well, there's there's a cool moment where he gets to see her again. Exactly. And she, you know, she's bounding, you know, through these buildings expertly. And he's like, holy crap, when did she get so good? Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, it's my girl. She's so good. Yeah. Yeah. So should we move on to the parent of the well, year, Straff Venture? Oh, <laughs> oh, I thought we were going to talk about Vin's mother. Because I feel like, you know, the fact that she murdered one child in front of the other and presented her oh. with a, a gift... That'll traumatize you. I mean, oh, yes. I guess in some respects, her actual parent was Reen. Yeah. And talk yeah. about authoritative. But Reen's the one who raised her. He raised her authoritatively because he thought this is the only way she's going to be able to survive. He, he didn't know any better. His, his mm-hmm. options were terrible. Well, I mean, you can't call him neglectful. He was very active. He was involved. But, he was trying. But yeah, he was like, well, what, 14? Yeah, that's rough. He, he was young. But, and, yeah. but the thing is, because of the situation he was in, he didn't have the luxury to just be authoritative. No. Yeah. Nor did he. Well, and you'll, you'll see this in a lot of stories with complicated people where it's like, they weren't the best parent dot, dot, dot. But I mean, given the degree of difficulty they were working with, we can cut them a little bit of slack. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. I kept, I kept finding like going through Mistborn and stuff that it's like, Oh, well, yeah, they, beat their child to get them to snap that's that's a horrible that's thing. bad parenting <laughs> but it's also like the cultural norm so it's really yeah you almost have to put those as like a bullet point and be like that that's it's, they may not all be terrible people it's hard to well every, everyone should situation. be graded on a curve mm-hmm. yeah. like it's it's not what uh it's not I'm trying to remember the phrase I heard someone say. It's not what you did that everyone else did around you that makes you unique. It's what you did that wasn't that like they everyone else. No, it's, it's it's one of those just horrible, horrible situations. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's all, like, I can imagine in noble society, like the beating mm-hmm. of the kid probably is almost looked at like a, a rite of passage. Yeah. Like this is your, you're oh. stepping into adulthood. Right. Mm-hmm. Ersic Wetlander in chat mentioned something that says also to an extent ruin using Reen's voice, mm-hmm. which is a very different kind of parenting. It's almost a, 
a brainwashing of sorts. Yeah. But like grooming, the fact that, but because Vin had the, uh, had the support structure of the crew, she was able to survive through that. But yeah, it, 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 it's not so much parenting as it is just sort of a, an influencing a child. Yeah. Which you can really mess up kids if you yeah. do it early enough and just, ugh, mm-hmm. it's sad. Um, but yeah, Straff Venture. So I, I called him a massive jerk. Oh, <laughs> it was like, yeah, that's putting it lightly. But that's yeah. his that's style of parenting. Massive yes. jerk. So, I mean, I think he's, he's the neglectful authoritarian. <laughs> Yeah, that that's probably going to put it that he's he's controlling, he's narcissistic, and he's just a horrible person. Narcissistic absolutely applies to, yeah. to Straff Venture. And I mean, you know, there's beating a lend, and then there's the whole thing with Zane, which mm-hmm. that's not good in any way, shape, or form yeah. at all. What, it's not right to, to turn your illegitimate son into a weapon? Nah, nah, I can't, I can't advise that one. Oh, so okay. Much. No, not bold yet. statement. I know. Hot takes. We, take yeah, we, we only take <laughs> the hottest of takes here. No lukewarm yeah. opinions. We think it's bad to turn children into weapons. Yeah, we, we hear well, about Ellen's mother, but she doesn't even have a name. I mean, if you look her up in the copper mind, she's referred she's to named. as Ellen's mother. And it, I think it's presumed. And it's like a sentence. Presumed dead. I think so. And so I'm like, I, I kind of have to give her something because Alend turned out to not be a horrible person, which means that she had to be a pretty good person to have him not go. At least either I, that I or like... either that or Straff was a bad enough person that Alend El- just knew to do pretty much the opposite of anything Straff told it's him to like, do. I don't like dad. Dad said to do that. Well, I'm going to do the opposite of that thing. Yeah. It's just ugh. Elend is Marius in Le Miserable, by the way. <sighs> All I know was... Literally, no one cried for Straff or his horse. I I'm pretty sure everyone cheered. Yeah, <laughs> see him go. Yes, uh, like, like that is one of the think. Think of how evil you have to be that Vin also bisected the horse and no one even blinked at it. Everyone's like, I don't really feel bad for the horse. Like, like Straff was so. It was evil. probably evil too. I yeah, felt but... bad about the horse, but I was really happy about Straff. So I was like. Okay, we're gonna keep. Going. It's worth the cost. Like everyone's like, yeah, that's collateral damage. That's just the horse was probably miserable at his stable anyway. Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, yeah, there's no so... way he's feeding his horse as well. Come on. You never know. Anyway, <laughs> so I, I figured we move on to some other parents. There's um, Spook and his uncle clubs. I and love this relationship. Spook's poor childhood. Like he snapped when he was five, and then his dad was gonna kill him. So his mom got him out of town. Well, and, you know, Spook, his relationship with uh, with clubs is just, it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Because what what was the name? Uh, he ha- What Lester does Lester Born mean? It means like Lefting left behind. I'm born, which means oh, yeah. I've been abandoned. I, ab- abandoned. Mm-hmm. Um, but clubs was there and he's like, no, I'll, I'll raise you. Clubs is gruff, but he still cares about Spook. Mm-hmm. Like, it's yeah. clear that he cares about Spook. He just probably doesn't know how to... And we don't know if there were scenes behind, you know, off, off screen where he was being more affectionate or whatever else. Mm-hmm. I just don't see him doing it in public. Right. Um, but, and then, he, I mean, he's got an image to keep up of being the, the crusty yeah. old man. and mm-hmm. It kind of makes me think of Secondhand Lions. Like with the two, love secondhand. Like the two great I could absolutely see Robert Duvall playing clubs. Oh yeah, I could absolutely <laughs> see that. Um, and then there's also Spook's relationship with Kelsier too. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, Kelsier wasn't as much of a father to him, but he still did. Oh, he had a huge effect not, on not Spook's intentionally. Life. Yeah, but he. I mean, that's that's I mean, one of the most gut wrenching scenes of Secret History. Where mm-hmm. Kelsier's like, holy crap, I've got, t- you know, my bonds to this guy are tighter than mm-hmm. to anyone. And then, like, he gets into his mind. Well, and I mean, he realizes, who, does, who does Ruin appear as? Yeah. You know, like, why? Because that's going to have one of the biggest effects. Mm-hmm. And, well, because that, that was one of the whole things. It's like, he didn't think anything of me. He gave everyone else a job, but not me. Yeah. Which, because Kelsier, cause it's one of those things, because this is fresh after uh preservation had told him it's like you were careless with the hearts of men they're not mm-hmm. your toys to play with 
and this is his first hands-on lesson with that mm-hmm. uh, lesson that he was given because he realized, oh, I, I didn't mean to have this much of an impression on the lad. Which leads to Kelsier in this instance unwittingly becoming the neglectful parent. Yeah. yeah. Because Lesterborn idolized him and he's young enough that he basically chooses him to fill in this role. Um, you know, I mean, there are others who idolize Kelsier, Demu being the most prominent probably, but but Spook What's was with him mm-hmm. and was following him. And, you know, he Kelsier didn't even ways, notice. Yeah. In some ways, he's the big brother that that Spook looked up to, mm-hmm. and while Clubs was the father that he never really understood. Yeah, but it, there, there's just an absolute, you know, father figure dynamic from that, and and it leads to him filling that negligent parent role. Well, yeah. no, but the thing I like is Kelsier gets a chance to make up for it. Mm-hmm. And I just love that whole scene. And it's like, he didn't get, you know, he didn't care. And he's like, I named, you know, I gave you a name, but you know, just like, you know, I cared enough for that. You were my well, and friend. that's the thing. His name before was I'm abandoned. Mm-hmm. And he gave him a name other than abandoned. He gave him a place. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So the other family that I, I was going to mention just briefly was Hammond and, and Mardra who we don't ever really see Mardra mm-hmm. his wife well no because she's, um, el- she's elsewhere for safety with the she's kids. outside the city pretending that he's you know just a guard and not anything else but I'm like he strikes me as a very good father figure even if he's not physically there but it's also to keep them safe he strikes me as someone who is uh, he's, he's very permissive with his kids probably mm-hmm. yeah he's probably the fun dad that he comes home and it's fun times and mom still has to be the. Cut, well, because he's been that. away. He's yeah. been away. He's been with, he, he's been undercover. You know, he's mm-hmm. working as a guard trying to over, or as a soldier trying to overthrow the empire that he works for. So yeah. he's in the most stressful situation you can be because somebody discovers what he's doing. He's dead. Like no yeah. trial, no nothing. He's just dead. And if they knew about um, his family, they'd probably kill him. And them. if they knew about his family, they'd come for them as well, which is why the family is never seen. Mm-hmm. So when he comes home and he sees his kids, you, you can he's spoiling them. Rotten. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't doubt it. And I think, but from the brief glimpses we get of just the descriptions from, from him, it seems that Mardra is probably the more uh, authoritative parent and is really good with that recognizes what's going on and so they're able to work with that within their own dynamic i don't think that he's like undermining his wife Mm -hmm. um i think they from what i can tell i i I suspect they have a very healthy parenting relationship relationship, yeah but when you know when he comes home he's going to spoil them he's also going to spoil her too so yeah Hmm. yeah um, and then on to era two. So. <laughs> Nobody has good parent oh, relationships oh, in man. era two. Yeah. So that's not true. Wax, okay. we, we Wax and Telson, they're, we don't even see their parents. Like no, we no. don't know their names. I couldn't find their names. No, we, it, we see his, uh, is it his grandmother? Yeah. Who was it? Oh, who raises him? Village, it was his, right? she's, she's, yeah, she's one of the, the terrorists. Village, he was there one it's, year. So he's, he's raised partially by his uncle. Yeah. Right. His uncle. Well, his, his uncle's a horrible person. Yeah. Yes. He stayed, Edward he stayed one year and I just got done with this part in uh, right. uh, Shadows. The of reread. Stone. The, mm-hmm. uh, the, his the grandmother, village. she seems very authoritative. Uh, she clearly has very negative views of things outside of the village. Authoritarian, you mean? Or, author- or yeah, sorry. Authoritarian. Yeah. Those yeah. words are so close. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. Um, and so, and so Wax, he rebels against it because he's like, no, I found my calling. I'm, I'm a law keeper. And she's very similar to Lear. And she's like, killing's bad. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, no, it's not. But, you know, it, it, and, sometimes it has to happen. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes a mad dog needs to be put down. Yeah. And so he didn't have a good relationship with them. He clearly didn't have a good relationship with his actual parents. He definitely right. doesn't have a good relationship with uh, Suit. Uncle. 
Yeah, right. Ed Edwin Lader. Edward. Yeah, he's he he just has no good parental figures, really. No. Well, and then he also had a little bit with uh, uh what's his name, Miles. Oh, yeah, Miles Thousand Lives, mm. Hundred Lives. Yeah. But just because, like, there's a little bit of uh, he he was kind of the the one that he looked up to, wasn't he? No, or am I remembering? He, did, wrong? he didn't look up to him, but they partnered up. Uh, he, okay. he he always uh, he he knew there was a, a darkness okay. there, but Wayne For some was reason the one I, who really understood there was a darkness there. Well, now there's another relationship talking talking about not parenting, but the big brother relationship that yeah. Wax takes with Wayne. You know, because Wayne. Yeah. Tried to rob Wax, didn't he? No, he he tried. Well, he was he, gonna hang. Oh, that's right. Her. But okay, yeah. but for some reason, I thought that he'd done something specifically to Wax. Am I remembering that wrong? Making it up in right. my head? No, because he killed uh, that girl's father. Uh, in that's the, right. In the botched robbery. The that's right. But then Wax, you know, stepped in. He's like this. Well, so kid the, so needs what happened? So needs what someone. happened? This was also part of what I just finished. <laughs> um, was he uh, basically most most people would have hung for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically he came in talk like he threw the gun down a well and was talking about like he could hear voices scream of that man screaming from the well. Mm-hmm. And basically he was so remorseful that they, that when he said, I will, you know, make him, you know, pay. He, for he basically crime. stood up for, stepped up for him. Yeah. And, and literally said like this, you know, this family has lost their caregiver. We're going to, you know, I will, I will fix Wayne who, who grew up in, or, you know, had a rough life, took the wrong path. Mm-hmm. And, and Wayne sends, uh, I believe half of everything he earns to that family. Yeah. Right. Uh, Cause they did lose their breadwinner. And there's a really cool scene where after he's visited the girl, you know, in, in the college, yeah, at the college. And she gives her, you know, spiel of, you will never be forgiven for what you've done. I'll take your blood money. Um, and he's just like, why is it like all these kids that we arrest, you know, what's the difference between them and me? Why did I get lucky? And mm-hmm. Wax tells him, it's like you, it's cause you got lucky. Like, yeah, it had, had you, I had, I caught you in the act. I would have shot you straight in the head. Mm-hmm. And he thanks Wax for that. <laughs> and he's Their like, relationship is really fascinating. I think yeah. mm-hmm. like it, it's a mix between father figure and big brother. Yeah. But like, that's what Wayne needed. Because he, you, I mean, you see in the the prologue chapter that was released that Wayne didn't have his parents for super long. His dad was gone at a really young age, and you see his mom just gone in the in yeah. the midst of that, and so he wasn't very old. She's like working mm-hmm. all day. She yeah, yeah, she's she's working as a minor or something like. Or is she a minor? I can't remember. She's a minor. I, it's, I think it's something like year. it's at least something like that. Yeah, but I mean, it's he didn't have parents for very long, and no. it's really easy to get sucked into the wrong side. Mm-hmm. Well, because what happens is you look for you know you don't have parents, you look for someone, mm-hmm. you look Everyone for some sort of connection, family. and yeah. if you end up with, with when you put a lot of desperate people together, it's <laughs> there's that only means. so much you can do. Yeah. And then there's and then the fun we... of Jackson. <laughs> yes. So Steris and Marasi's dad. Uh, yeah. Jackson and so like with Cole. him, I kind of had it that he's both neglectful as well as authoritative because he's more authoritative to Mar- to Steris, but he's neglectful to well, Marasi. Well, Marasi not even acknowledged. Yes, no, she Mar- has Mar- to Mar- say, I'm your cousin instead of yeah. I'm your, your uh, d- to the point daughter. that when Wax jumps in to because he thinks that uh, Bleeder's going after him, mm-hmm. um, he's like, "Where's my daughter?" And even Wax is like, "As if you only have one." <laughs> like it's just sort of, it, his his favoritism because mm-hmm. he's horrible. look he's embarrassed like mm-hmm. it, it's a it's a black mark. It, it's a physical sign of his indiscretion. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which has messed up Steris and Marasi because Steris mm-hmm. like put in the, the wedding or the marriage clause, you know, what marriage contract. Marriage contract. She's mm-hmm. like, you go ahead after we've had X number of kids or whatever, then you can go ahead and have however many affairs. She just assumes. She just assumes yeah. that's how it works. Which and, is why I love 
the relationship that the two of them develop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so cute. Well, and the thing with Marisy that's interesting is because like when you actually see him in a conversation, it's you, you can tell like he's an amiable person. He's friendly. He's not mm-hmm. someone who's trying to be a jerk to anyone. Yeah. It's just No, he's just not trying not to just, be a jerk to her. Yeah. He's just Yeah. It's just flawed. But at the same time, he gave Marcy a very generous stipend to sending her to college, which is not cheap. Like he yeah. is taking care of her. Now, how much of that is because he's it's guilt. guilt. Yeah, much it's that. guilt, but it's it's him trying to have his cake and eat it. Yeah. Yeah, cuz I mean, he's he's doing the financial obligations but you can bet that he's not going to have big, meaningful conversations with her. And he's not. And I mean, she goes through life thinking that she's useless. Her yeah, alimentary is it... useless. She's useless because she's not because she's illegitimate. She's she's useless, useless, useless. And so she's pushing herself so hard in school mm-hmm. to make herself useful mm-hmm. because 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 that's again, all she's heard. She's a physical reminder of what he did. Mm-hmm. And it's not her fault. It's it's not fair. It's not fair at all. When you see her mother's also kind of messed up because her mother is sort of living her life through Marisy. Because Marisy talks about she's receiving all those letters from her mother being like, I can't believe you are working for the constables. You you got all this education. You know, you should be, you know, being paid more. And Mm -hmm. it's Marisy's found her calling. Right. And but the part of the problem is her. I think Marcy says something almost word for word. Like her mother is looking for a sign that she could have been the woman that was married to Jackson Combs and Marcy's mm-hmm. her evidence of that. And so she has yeah. two parents, one that's trying to avoid her and the other's trying to live through her. And Marcy's trying to Balance negotiate that. the, mm-hmm. the obstacles that come with that. And she needs to find out who she is. Well, I mean, to the point where she even, you know, develops this attachment to Wax at mm-hmm. first. You know, she idolizes him as this great lawman because she doesn't have parents that she can kind of Looks respect like so, yeah. in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Wayne's the only one that ha- seems to have a decent parent. But like we said. She's, Poverty. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's she's too busy trying to just keep meat on the table. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So she's just trying to keep him alive and then she doesn't make it. So that's where it's just. So yeah, era two, the parenting not going too well. Not going too great. Yeah. So Although it looks like we're going to finally get to see uh, Wayne or Wax and Steris parenting. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling that's going to be pretty it. good. Yes. Well, and we also haven't. Uh, you know, we also saw. Because Wax had his own weird parents, but then his sister, you know. Oh, yeah. like She, she has she all got, sorts of. She got messed up by their uncle, I'm sure, because she works for mm-hmm. the set. So who knows? Well, she was above him in the set. Yeah. Yeah. Like she. Oh, like she, She's above Mr. Suit? Yeah, yeah. She's above. She's a sequence. He's only. She's a sequence. He's a suit. And it's, cl- it, it's clear. Like one of the things that. Uh, in the flashback we get with wax talking about like seeing the counterfeit coin mm-hmm. with his uncle, mm-hmm. his uncle makes a, like a passing comment. Like, yeah, your sister doesn't have the focus you do. Like it's clear that, uh, Ed Warren had put all his eggs into the wax basket. He was very mm-hmm. dismissive of his sister, mm-hmm. which is it's hilarious. Cause she ended like, I, th- she strikes me as the type of person who's motivated by spite. <laughs> and so until Ed Warren had, you know, written her off, she probably wasn't doing anything. It, it's very it, Azula. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. She's got some Azula. <laughs> Scary. Fun times. Yeah. So um, Warbreaker basically just has the one set of parents, and that's Vivenna and Ciri's parents. And oh, favoritism much? A- yeah he's got horrible favoritism it even to the you know like he's like oh well my daughter might die but i really like this daughter so we're gonna send the other one that i don't like so much to the point where both of them are messed up by it Mm -hmm. siri again siri grows up thinking that she's useless Mm -hmm. and vivina grows up with the world on her shoulders oh yeah she can't she can't relax at now, all. Like every now, she's strict. 
Dedalin isn't quite the same as some of these other parents who play favorites because he does love both of his daughters. Mm-hmm. It's clear that he he loves them both. Well, in his letter, he says, I know it's horrible to say, mm-hmm. but I realized I had to send one of them. And mm-hmm. so I chose the one that wasn't my favorite. And he's like, mm-hmm. he knows it's awful to say, mm-hmm. but he views it like he views himself in a literal Sophie's choice. Right. Yeah. Like, to, for- to the point that it's so hilarious that nobody in the, the court of the of to tell her thought that there's like, what a politically savvy move. <laughs> we weren't ready for this. We weren't ready for this one. And it's like, Oh no, he just had a favorite daughter. <laughs> That's all. But it's, it's a different angle on that style of parent, you know, who, who does yeah. clearly have a preference, but he does also clearly love them both. Yeah. It's just that Siri was more difficult. Yeah, she she was more of a free spirit. She didn't want to conform. And she just made it harder for that. And part of that, though, like, it's really interesting because he preferred Vivina because she was more responsible and, you know, more noble. Mm -hmm, And proper. But Siri grew up being, you know, growing up thinking she was despair, that she was unimportant, which led her to be less proper, less no. And so it's like, Mm -hmm. she's acting out for attention. He's basically saying, I preferred Vivina because I preferred Vivina. Yeah. Because the way he treated them, they, they grew up. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. Yeah. So, cause I mean, parenting does help guide your children, but they still can. Mm-hmm. do their own thing like you don't it's that, whole, sense that it's that fun nature versus nurture argument mm-hmm. it, both of them are very important they're both big factors yeah mm-hmm. and for silence and her own mother like oh boy <laughs> like that one it's super dependent on their situation because it's, it's another live in the forest of death you know yeah. it's mm. it's a it's another um situation similar to Reen's where they're in a desperate situation. It's like, you need to learn this record, this lesson. Mm -hmm. You do not have the luxury of failing to learn this lesson once because even once can mess everything up and destroy you. Mm -hmm. And you can see the difference in how silence is raising her daughters Mm -hmm. versus how she was raised because she isn't doing She's still teaching them about stuff, but she's not putting them in. Well, okay, you're going to get put in in this circle, this this you know to fight to the death, basically with this mm-hmm. shade, or is it? Yeah, it's a shade, and she doesn't do that to her daughters, but she makes sure that they are learning how to deal with them, right? And those things. So. She's trying. She's trying to learn from her parents, right? Mm-hmm. And that, like that you happens. Said, everything's on a curve. Mm-hmm. That happens yeah. a lot where. You need to learn. You know, what, what's the saying? Uh, a smart man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. Mm-hmm. I think that sounds right. Yeah. And and so building upon that structure that came before, it's like again, it was awful. It was brutal. Mm-hmm. And that's why she sort of learned and grew and evolved her parenting based around yeah. what her experiences were well and in some ways it it kind of mirrors strangely ellen's growth as a leader where he had this whole idea of i'm going to give everyone choice i'm going to you know he wanted Mm -hmm. to have this nice very liberal government only he's the leader at the middle of the end of the world when it's like and he suddenly realizes no i have to i have to become an emperor it's the only way we're going to survive we need a dictator well, and that's sort of what, you know, Vin realizes that too. I did something bad. I made yeah. you emperor. Yeah. And well, he lost like, control of things when, yeah. he, when he tried to do that. He tried to be very, very permissive as king. Well, it's, it's, it's very, uh, in the literal sense, Machiavellian. The whole thing about the prince, like if you look at it, you got to understand Machiavelli, he, he was, he was, there was all sorts of feckless leaders where he was and they were always getting bowled over. And they were, you know, constantly stuck in a losing war situation. And he's like, okay, well, would we rather have a tyrant or do we want to keep, you know, losing? Mm-hmm. And 
and the, so you get something like the prince and the prince wasn't even there's there's more to it but, there's all sorts of stuff about the but prince. but there's yeah. a point where it's like where's the cost to benefit ratio where where's that balance have to be struck and i think clearly we can see silence's mother went too far on the mm-hmm. uh, the authoritative side mm-hmm. but there's authoritarian authoritarian dang it um but yeah <laughs> i'm always gonna say it backwards well, uh, I was, it was really hard typing about, I'm like, oh my goodness, they're so close. <sighs> um, yeah. And then like, basically from there, it's just Stormlight Archive, which is a mm-hmm. lot. Well, so, and it makes sense. Stormlight Archive started after he's already a parent. And so mm-hmm. the parenting relationships are insanely important in the story. Oh yeah. And they're super complicated and they're people. That's, that's the biggest factor is that each character is a fleshed out person so they're not going to be perfect at every aspect of things they're not going to be all terrible they're they're Mm -hmm. people they have all sorts of well it's because everyone brings their baggage to their parenting Mm -hmm. their generational trauma is something i'll never do this to my kids and then you're like oh i've I've become my father i've become my mother (laughs) i just did the same thing well like your first one you have here laren and hasina Mm -hmm. like Cena was she she was the rebel she she left a uh higher standing a, a higher standing mm-hmm. and so she's she's a little more nurturing a little she, a little more authorit- authoritative authoritative and that's the thing is she's definitely the authoritative parent in mm-hmm. that the, the storm blessed household yeah yes <laughs> whereas Liren is the result of you know a couple of generations slowly climbing you know their way climbing up the, the ranks, social yeah. ladder mm-hmm. And he's now finally in the position to where I can put my son in a good position. Mm-hmm. I can do it. Only problem for him is his first son turns out is born to to be a soldier. And the mm-hmm. second son, there's no way that TN ever was going to cut open a body. Yeah, mm-hmm. he couldn't. He couldn't even be an assistant because the blood made him like pass out or whatever. Right. So. You, so it's I, I think Liren gets a lot more crap than he deserves uh, in the community. Um, mostly because Liren's trying. He is trying. Yeah. He's he's kind of in, he's in the city and, or Hearthstone? Hearthstone, right? yeah. yeah. Hearthstone. And Either Hearthstone, Hearthstone. I, it's a pronunciation the thing. The place but. that they live. Um, and he's kind of an outsider and everybody thinks that he's kind of a little bit uppity like that. Oh, here's this surgeon. And I mean, they'll come to him when they need well, help. He's, he's don't. also, he's also the guy who cuts people open, which is creepy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People don't like that. Well, you have to put your life in his hands. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the same way that, you know, always, everyone's always going to look at the mortician with a side eye. It's like, yeah, why like, would you choose to do something like this? Why would like you this? deal with dead bodies? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, and so, you know, and I, like these days, doctors have a lot more respect than they did back in the day. I mean, the first people who studied um, human anatomy, they had to rob graves to do it because oh. there there were no corpses for them to study. And, then and so there's... there was this just stigma around the profession. Mm-hmm. There's actually crimes that were committed to get bodies for people to work on too, but mm-hmm. that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah. But then you you also have the baggage of Liren butting heads with the with Rashon. Right. right. The, and the Lord. Yeah. And it's just one of these things where all that sacrifice that Liren has put his entire life towards, and then your son is rejecting that. Mm-hmm. Like, Rashon was a permissive parent, by the way. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But I didn't you, put him in the list because I'm like, I'm not even gonna try that one. <laughs> But you, it's one of these things where you see why he's the way it is. It doesn't excuse the but you can understand. The, the inflexibility, mm-hmm. but you understand it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems it, at, at the end of Rhythm of War, he has the Shash brand on his forehead. He's learning. He's learning to be better about it. Well, uh, what's the line he says? It's like, I figured if everyone else is going to believe in my son, I probably should too. Mm-hmm. Like it's that the admitting like that, well, and then and then Cal because both Kaladin and him are are stubborn as all get out, right? Mm-hmm. Not neither of them budging at all, um, and it's just the whole thing that Kaladin says. Maybe your way works for you, and my way works for me, and mm-hmm. we can just be okay with that. 
Well, and that's one of the ways that Hasina, in my opinion, is just such a, I love Hasina. I, yeah. I feel like Hasina gets overlooked way too much because mm-hmm. she's the one who's actually able to get through to Liren and, you know, just be like, you and know, this is your son and a Kaladin. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes you have people who are that stubborn that you need a mediator and she fills that role so well. Yeah. But uh, also the, the, one of the things that I've heard talked about with relationships um, is how important in any relationship, how it's important to sometimes you have to fight. And because the, the, because if you just sit there and always lay down and always mm. put off the argument, it's just going to be this poison that slowly rots. And we get to see it in rhythm of war where her and Liren have a real fight and mm-hmm. Liren tries to just sort of walk off. And she's like, no, 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 no. We're doing this right now. Mm-hmm. Cause Liren's been, been putting it off. What, one of my favorite lines from a cheesy nineties movie is from first night where the, the villain basically says your words are talking you out of peace and into war. And Arthur Sean Connery's voice stares him down and he says, there is a peace that is only to be found on the other side of war. And I was just like, okay, that it works. Um, but like, like, cause like you were saying, sometimes you need to have the fight. Yeah. You'll have the resentment and stuff, you know, bubbling up inside and it just, it doesn't go well. Like I've, I've noticed that when I get grumpy about things, if I just let it sit and sit and sit and sit forever, mm-hmm. I have to say it before I snap at something dumb that's mm-hmm. unrelated and seems to come out of nowhere, but I've been holding everything else in. So it just breaks. Well, and the thing that is important about the fight that Hasina and Liren had is both of them were very, very, con- you know, absolutely convicted in their is that right? The right word? I'm blanking. Conviction? They're, they have conviction. In, in, the, in their belief. Mm-hmm. But they still loved, loved each other. Yes. And because of that, they were able to deal with each other. Even though they disagreed so strongly, they still loved each other. And that's how they were able to stick through it. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things that highlights is the poison of, the poisonous nature of needing to be right. Mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. both Kaladin and Liren have because mm-hmm. yeah. they kept, they had the same argument over and over again, whether or not you could kill to protect and neither one of them would budge at all and just refused because they're looking well, for an absolute where there isn't one. It's great. Yeah. There are several times where you see Kaladin trying to come at it from his father's angle. I mean, he tries to be the surgeon. Mm-hmm. And he's but, good at it. Like that's that's he's, the that's the thing he, about he's it. He's good. good. But yeah. and, and so I think that's also part of it. Is Kalanin I'm not saying he was perfect in this. Like he, he was th- blameless in this argument at, at all. But he was trying to come and when Liren tried to meet him in the middle, that's when they were able to when they were both working to meet in the middle. That's when it finally worked out. Mm-hmm. They're both able to listen to each other mm-hmm. instead of just going, I need to argue my point. Right. So. When they talk to each other instead of at each other. Yes. Um, and then, let's see. The next one I had on the list was Adeline Renarin's parents. So um, Dalinar and, and Evie. We should probably start with Evie because that's a little shorter. Yeah, Evie. For dark reasons. She, was, she was authoritative. I don't know that she was quite permissive because she did have them like doing the things that they were supposed to do she was sort of somewhere in between she was yeah she was trying to be authoritative but she wasn't strong enough to be authoritative yeah and she, I mean, she was a very in, shrinking personality yeah and i mean especially in the alethi culture mm-hmm. like they're little boys they're supposed to become big strong soldiers and big right. men and that's not how she was is gonna picture her kids probably and Dalinar is too far the other way. Plus, he was. You, you think in the middle of uh, be the warlord mode, he might have been a little <laughs> too far the other way. Well, he was also he was a combination of authoritarian and uh, neglectful. Mm-hmm. Uh, leaning I mean, much more with, towards neglectful, especially with Renarin. Yeah, because um, Renarin just was not it, the kind of kid that he wanted. Renarin was the spare. 
Renarin was the one who wasn't Adolin. Yeah, Adolin, Adolin was Adolin like, was the soldier. Adolin was, was his like golden child. Up and it was great, yeah. Literally. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. No, the well, I mean, look, Adolin Adolin like walks up and salutes his dad. I know. And he's, is like, I'm adorable. gonna win my own shard blade. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, he's like, chip off the old block, that one. You know, it's just <laughs> like, oh, this is just what I want to right there. He's cute. But um, then Renarin is is physically weak and not exactly well and the thing is all of this all of this stems from the fact that dalinar wasn't with the woman that he actually wanted but Mm -hmm. he also like because he was afraid of what he was capable of he's like okay i need to get married now so that this is not an issue because he had that moment where he's like i was about to kill my brother i could take everything that he has for myself and so that scared him. And so, and then Dalinar stopped trusting himself. He started becoming an alcoholic. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, D- Dalinar's character growth is incredible. What's interesting is the fact that he is, he's starting to become authoritative. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, after the, after visiting the Valley, he definitely just, he becomes a lot more authoritative. Yeah. Also kind of authoritarian. Like oh. he's always telling Adolin, no, you will do this. You will not do that. You know, we, this is what we do. Mm-hmm. And they have he's the speaking. Pretty strict still. Yeah. Well, to the point of very similar to Laren and Kaladin, the, the killing of Sadius mm-hmm. and the wedge that this has driven between them because Dalinar's like, okay, no, we can, we can work this out. We can maybe do that. And Adolin's like, no. I feel no remorse for what I've done. If I had a chance to do it again, I would I'd do it because <laughs> that man needed to die. And no. And he's like, Oh, you can be a better man than me. And Adolin's like, Oh my freaking goodness. <laughs> like, it's just <laughs> Stop putting that in me. Well, it's because yeah. Dalinar is bringing his baggage of all the guilt he feels for being a warlord. And Oh, you know, murdering his wife, uh, mm. He's bringing that in, although it also kind of hurts the relationship now that Adolin knows that he's the one who killed his mother. I mean, you think yeah. about the moment where Renarin, Renarin brought him alcohol, alcohol. because he I knew know. this is what dad needs. This He's going through stuff and it's just heartbreaking. That scene hurts so bad. But it's absolutely beautifully written mm-hmm. because it was that moment that moment of misguided compassion that Dalinar saw and he realized who, who have I become? How, how have, how have I brought my relationship with my sons to this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, uh, man. The, yeah. A lot of baggage there. <laughs> well, and again, this is the one that he thought of as the spare. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this is the boy who so desperately wanted his father's approval. Yeah. And he has the compassion that Dalinar is not familiar with at this point. Though by Rhythm of War, their their relationship's a lot better. Oh, Even by Rhythm if, of War, absolutely. But I'm, oh, yeah. I'm just talking about the moment like the, the moment you know, where he, yeah, he be- before the valley. Again, the valley mm-hmm. turns Dalinar in it allows him to grow into the man that he could have become without those memories trauma. weighing on him all the time mm-hmm. that trauma yeah hmm. but yeah so so want to talk about, talk about uh, the dirt your bag? favorite your favorite person <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah so in the text i have gavilar dirt bag crossed out authoritarian yeah um and he's, absent oh he's so neglectful bad. yeah he's, well, he's just everything bad he's a talk about someone who he just doesn't know, like he can't see past himself. No, he's a narcissist. narcissist. Yeah. He's it's an definitely. absolute de- like textbook definition yeah. of a narcissist. Mm-hmm. And, but to the point where he doesn't even see what he has around him. That, like had, cause, mm-hmm. had he involved Navani, like he probably would have figured out things a lot sooner. Yesna oh, yeah. is an absolute savant, but you know, we don't know the specifics of it, but she's clearly going through something as a kid. So mm-hmm. he wrote her off and yeah, he, he was, he only uses her as a, as a bargaining chip. Yeah. Yep. She's just there to marry off because yeah. he just doesn't want to deal with her. Yeah. Well, he just, yeah, he does. 
he just does. He's like, eh, okay. He makes a quick judgment and then he's on to the next thing. Yeah. He doesn't take time to learn. Elicar wasn't raised to be king. No. Because he comments on that. Because Gavilar didn't think he'd die. He'd ever die. It's like, well, and so why, why do I need to raise a successor if I'm going to be around forever? Yeah. It, it, you can see it messed both of them up. Like Yasta's amazing, but she's messed up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because she had a messed up relationship with her dad. Yeah. Well, I still she, think he was abusive. He, pro- I wouldn't put it past him, but I, we don't know. We mm-hmm. don't have any proof either way. Yeah. The, uh, I think the bigger thing is just the fact that, cause we have everyone who talks about how great a guy Gavilar was. And so it's clear that he wasn't always like this, but it shows what getting wrapped up in what your delusions of grandeur can do to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like he's thinking of himself as a God and what in the, the, whatever the fifth book's getting called, you know, we see in the flashback, what's the line from Thadakar? And it's like, be careful. You're not immortal yet. Yeah. Well, it's which is especially interesting coming from Thydekar. <laughs> yes. Because yes. he knows. <laughs> he would know if anybody, yeah. But hmm. so, yeah. Anyway, we can go to the rock star, though. Navani. She I love Navani. Awesome. She's so good. Well, Navani steps in. Like, Navani is everyone's mother. Because, you know, she's she's Yesna and, and uh, Elokar's mother. Mm-hmm. But then she also steps in as a mother for Adolin and uh, Renarin Renarin. after Evie dies. Mm-hmm. She takes Gavinor under her wing after his parents are gone. Yeah, Gavinor. Like she, she steps in at, and raises him. She takes Shalon in. She takes Lift in. I know. Like it's everybody. Navani is the mother of all mothers. And then, <laughs> then her spren is the child. So you know, it's extra fitting. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, the sibling, the sibling. The si- oh, well, yeah, the sibling. But that makes it. If she, you know, if the sibling, is, she's the mother. It's a whiny yeah. child. <laughs> Couldn't stand that thing. I hated it. No. Man, everything's falling apart. No, no, me, like, I'm going to hold on to my grudge. No, no. Navani is incredible. Like I, I, I absolutely adore her as a character. Yeah. Well, she, um, she's like, a cultivator. If you know, she absolutely is a cultivator. Look, look at her relationship with all her engineers. Mm -hmm. Like she's not worried about getting all the credit. She's worried about getting the job done and let's make something awesome. And like, and she's mothering them. It's like, it's like, look at this cool glove we've made. Hmm. Look at this cool thing that will rip your arm off. You've made is let's, um, Mm -hmm. let's dial this back a little bit. <laughs> Nova, that, that's Navani coming in and saying, no, 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 no. Don't jump off the roof of the bed sheet. That is not going to work as a parachute. If you want to jump, jump from this step over here with the space and with the cushion to land on. <laughs> do not do it but, from there. But she just sort of comes over and guides them away from it. She doesn't yell at them. Oh, you morons. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Yeah. She, you know, she's just like, let's come at this from a different angle. Like it, it's yeah. just, she guides them into it. She is absolutely authoritative in let's, the best way. Let's try to think about the fact that an actual human will use this first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What will this do to the arm? Be bad. But she's basically working to make sure that everyone that she has stewardship over, which as queen it's is everyone mm-hmm. does well. She is an absolute nurturer. Mm-hmm. Not, and not in a, she starts off in a passive way. That's the other thing that's great about the relationship that she builds with Dalinar. After she's basically out of, you know, she, she's out from under Gavilar's shadow. Oh, yeah. She blossoms. And then she and Dalinar together, they they support each other in the best ways so that she just becomes incredible. Mm-hmm. But yeah. When I grow up, I want to be Navani right there. Except I don't want to have that terrible husband, the first one. Journey before destination, you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so. Lindavar. Oh man, yeah. The other big. Oh gosh. Fail is poor. All the Devar children. Oh man, that's. Talk talk about an absolute Greek tragedy of a family. 
Mm-hmm. That, like, that's a very good description. Well, because it seems like Linda Var was trying to be a good father. And yeah. then his wife tried to kill his daughter. His daughter killed her. Church! He <laughs> <laughs> he he took the blame though, so that uh, it drove him to, crazy to protect the kids. Mm-hmm. But that drove him crazy, so he became abusive, and it's just like, oh, and, uh, and then he no one his here had a chance. Wife. It just there's there's so many problems, so many. And problems. then all four of his kids have their own traumas that they're working through. Well, yeah, and then one of them's dead. So because he became. <laughs> It sounds like he was running with the Skybreakers. <laughs> yeah, he was one of the, he was probably with the Skybreakers. I still think Balot yeah. could become a Dustbringer. I I think he, he could oh. absolutely become a Dustbringer. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, yeah, you see the did. way he was working with the Kremlings. He's like pulling them apart, and like it's horrifying. Yeah, but, but it, it's he's very... looking to see how they tick. How they tick. Mm-hmm. It, it's very Dustbringer. I, I'm. I'd actually almost be shocked if he doesn't become a Dustbringer. The only and thing I know is there are it talks are... about how it's about personal uh, personal excellence. Which I think that he could, well, part of it is all of the orders are kind of corrupted in some form or other at this yeah. point. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can definitely see him. And particularly with Shalon um, working as, you know, as light weavers do, seeing potential in others, I, I can mm-hmm. see him being affected and by that and stepping into the role as a dust bringer. And I mean, he's now in a far more stable situation. He's not having to worry about where is his next meal coming from? Is his dad going to beat him again? Is all these horrible things. So he could focus on not just survival. Well, yeah. Oh, that's the other part of everything. The, all the risky deals he made, the fact that he's, he's in debt to the freaking ghost bloods. Yeah. That's not a high stress situation, is it? Nah. No, it's just oh gosh. What a tragic family. It's in 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 so scary. many different ways. Mm-hmm. Well, you, because you like, sit there, you look at some of them, you're just like, if things had gone better, would they mm-hmm. would they not have cracked under the pressure? Right. Yeah. But yeah. Because like you said, he he was trying. And then he was broken. And it just it got worse and worse and worse. It just snowballed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the only other parents I really had were talking about Lyft. But I mean, we already talked about her and Navani a little bit. Mm-hmm. and that, that one is just fun. Yeah. Well, and then Lyft's mother. who We don't know too much about We don't know about much her. about her, but we know that she was kind. She was caring. I, I, I like the description that Lyft uses. She's talking about how something was soft, like mothers. Mm-hmm. I know. And it, it was just that description, just using that being the word that she chose alone, opens up so much about Lyft as a character. Yeah. Just like this is the word that she thinks of. Okay. You know, when she's trying to think of something that's soft, her mother is what comes to mind. Mm-hmm. I, I I feel like that that description and that sequence. I think that was from uh, from her book, uh, Edge Dancer. I think so. Could be. Um, that was part of the reason that because like before that, I didn't really like Lyft at all. Before I read Edge Dancer, I thought she was a little obnoxious and awesomeness. Brandon was trying too hard and <laughs> stuff, but. In Edge Dancer, we get a peek inside of her and learn where she came from. And suddenly you understand her better. And she's no longer seems obnoxious. She seems tragic. Mm. And you just want to give her a hug. Yeah. Or pancakes. So she probably just want a snack. Mm hmm. Yeah. I'd like to give her pancakes. That's less committal. You could also look a little bit at Stump, not necessarily as a parent for Lyft because she was only around her for a very a brief bit. time, but she did influence her in some way. Mm-hmm. Again, just sort of a a bit authoritarian, a bit gruff. Very like clubs. But still trying mm-hmm. to, to do right. Yeah, because I mean, if you're running an orphanage, you have to expect that you're going to lose some kids and well, that's going to make it 
hard. And that's the other thing. There is, there's different angles to each of these, you know, cause you have the, the authoritarian, you have the, oh, what's the, what, not the missing, the, no, the, Neglect, but, uh, the neglectful, permiss- neglectful. That's the one. The reason why they fit into those categories also kind of influences what sort of parent they are, you know, cause you can have the neglectful parent who's there because they can't be there. Or you have the neglectful parent who's there for self, who's not there for selfish reasons. You have the authoritarian parent. Is it, a, is it selfish authoritarian? Like, um, you know, like, or is it authoritarian? Like I'm trying to do well by this child, like, like silence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it's such a complex, that that's the thing about parenting. Like I, you know, I, I say this as, you know, as a single um, person with no ch- children, but I have 20 nieces and nephews and I've been able to observe at least I, you know, I, I can't speak to this directly, but there are things about different styles of parenting that work and don't. And it's just far more complex than it often gets boiled down to by people with and without children. And the other really hard part is that you can't parent the same way for every kid. Right. Because every kid is going to take your method of parenting slightly different one of my uh, kids is way more sensitive than the other mm-hmm. one. The other one, you can be like, dude, that was awful. Why'd you do that? And he goes, mm-hmm. oh, okay, sorry. And my other child, you say, that was really bad. She just melts. <laughs> and you're mm-hmm. just like, oh, I have I have to be able to, you have to be able to take criticism and uh-huh. you can't melt. Just like. Well, and it, so it's, it's also, you can't even, yeah. you can't even parent the same kid the same way for day to day. Right. Mm-hmm. You've got to assess, they're a human being, what what is probably going to be going on in the background. Like my kids have been acting up a little bit more recently because summer's ending school's coming up and we're sort of going, my goodness, why is this happening? (gasps) School's coming up. They're probably stressed about that. There's Mm -hmm. big changes coming and they act up a bit more. Well, it's just, it's the delicate balance, but you know, you're trying to provide enough structure that Mm -hmm. they can, they can grow, but you're also trying to give them enough freedom that they're, that they can grow the way they need to. It's the whole mm-hmm. order versus chaos. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. You gotta, you gotta balance it. It's a balancing act every day. It's fun time. Well, it's like when you're like this, I know it's not the exact same thing. I'm just linking a principle. It's like when you're growing a garden, you don't water them the same amount every single time because you have to see, is it soaking? Are they, you know, is Did there mold rain? growing? Did it rain? You also, you, you just got to, take each day differently because circumstances change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other, there were two other, his parents that I wanted to, that I wrote notes for and there's Eshenai and Venley and their mom, like she just seems like she was trying, but she had serious health issues by the end of it. You know, like her Mm -hmm. memory's just going and her kids both reacted differently to it. And then the other interesting thing, one was um, high Prince Ruthar and his son, Relis. Dude got what he deserved last time. Dude got what he deserved. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, it's speaking of it's people kind of, that no one shed a tear for. And I mean, it was, it was just nice to see there's, yeah, here's a kid who's got a really not great upbringing. His parents or his dad, at least is a terrible person, but he's choosing to go. Nope. I'm going to choose better mm-hmm. and grow from that. So, so yeah. between Relis, Straff and uh, Gavilar, who's the worst parent? Uh, R- Ruthar, you mean? Cause Ruthar was the dad. Oh, sorry, Ruthar. Yeah. Relis Ruthar, is the Straff, son, and yeah. who? And Gavilar. Gavilar. I feel like Straff is the worst because he was doing it more on purpose, whereas Gavilar yeah. was trying to help the world, yeah, or whatever. But, but Ga- Gavilar just was—he was a—he was, he was a narcissist, and he ignored do, his kids, whereas Straff actively tortured them. Do we yes, have to rank them? Can I just say no? They're just, just bad people. <laughs> They're just no. They shouldn't have had children. No, they should not have been able to. Nah. Mm. It is but. fitting. All three of them have died in the way that you most want them to have died. You're like, yes, you you goodness. want Straff to have get. been killed by his, his son's wife, who his son adores and who he was very dismissive of. You want mm-hmm. Gavilar to die ignominiously alone not killed by the grand people he was scheming with, but the people he wasn't even considering. 
And you want Relis to just die at Yasna's hands because it's just so satisfying. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh man yeah so i mean overall i've i've loved reading all the different parents in the Mm costume it's been really good and you can see like we've been talking about like the definite growth in the complexity of the character there's a couple others we haven't talked about which ones um well from the emperor's soul i wouldn't say it's parent but gautona was definitely a father figure in Mm. uh, the emperor's life yes that's true I focused on shy. I wasn't thinking about Gautona just because he, I mean, like this is the boy who was supposed to be better. And you see Gautona who, who clearly looked at him like a son. Mm -hmm. Um, The other one that we haven't talked about is in white sand, which is a, there's a big parent moment because I always forget about white sand because (laughs) Kenton's father is, He's got Primity, him. just horrible. Yeah. Well, you have Kitten's father, and then you have—I can't remember his name—but Kitten's friend, his father yeah, was his friend. And his his yeah. There were two really bad fathers in that. When is that <laughs> compendium coming out? Uh, I'm soon. It should be very very soon. I've, yeah, I was I've been say, getting like, emails. I thought that was right around the corner. I'm gonna need. I've, to I've been getting yeah. emails about it from. I have. I don't remember seeing a date exactly yet, but just that soon. But like they're 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 getting very very close they're actively printing and whatever else mm-hmm. probably i'll need to reread so. that because well and it's supposed to be drastically edited yeah that'll be nice so so no boom boxes in the background <laughs> i need to go find i don't know i mean box. you don't know what things what it's like on tell dane i don't maybe they just have it whatever. maybe it's a sand powered boom box hey why not it could happen <laughs> okay well silicate could be a wire uh <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but no, I just, it was, it was kind of fun to go through and, and kind of analyze and go, okay, so how do his parents tend to trend? And like, he didn't have too many permissive parents that I saw, which was interesting, but they don't tend to make for know. interesting characters. Brats are just, I mean, no one likes yeah. a brat. Well, a lot of the permissive parents were like the, the, the other high princes, you know, yeah, not yeah. necessarily Ruthar, but the other high princes were definitely the, the mm-hmm. permissive of their kids. You see these spoiled children. They're, they're not the up. type that become movers and shakers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And stories are naturally going to center around people who make things ones. happen. Yeah. And so, but like negligence, you can, you can have a storyline around that. Mm-hmm. A good parent that, you know, raises up, you know, someone who's awesome. That can work authoritative, someone the, to rebel against, but well, permissive. Adolin with, Adolin with a permissive parent would have been a completely different character. Yeah. Oh Yeah. I mean, he's already a bit of a fop. I can't imagine exactly what he would have been like with a permissive <laughs> yeah. parent. Oh man! But he would have so many nice outfits. You know that. He I mean, he so already does. Outfits. I can't imagine. Well, I mean, he'd have even more. I guess uh, Set would have been a bit of a permissive parent. Yes, from uh, from but, Mistborn. But with his own twist to it, that there yeah. was. Oh yeah, well he's ruthless, but he's also very permissive. Yeah, yeah. As long as they're yeah. Well, and you also and don't know how much of is he permissive because his daughter is manipulating him. <laughs> yeah. Al Alrian said, uh, "She, she, she. I, I would love a couple of more scenes with her. I bet she. Oh, I too. Me I too. I bet she would have been a lot of fun. Mm. I want to see her in like a Secret History too, where we, you know, where they're working on stuff post." Uh, yeah. Um, post Catasandra. I mean, we do know that she was the one that sort of painted the image of Vin as like both the, the stealthy assassin and the, like the perfect the lady, beautiful lady, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, she's trying to cast this idea that you can be both feminine and, you know, you can and, have it all. Yeah. Deadly. Just, yeah. And deadly. Like you, you don't have to pick and choose. And it's like, I, I feel like we're 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 whitewashing a little bit of what happened here, but <laughs> Alrian is totally the type who uh, oh, would, she, she doesn't care about no, it. No, she'd be. I mean, Let's she got into a relationship with a soother, not even caring that they're manipulating each other. But <laughs> well, she no, doesn't that, care. She just sees that as him putting. Is it putting them on even ground? This is fun. You know? It just spices up the relationship, right? You know. Just- it touches on the the emotions yeah. there here and there. Hmm. 
So yeah. we love hearing from you. So keep on sending in questions. You can ask us about the Cosmere or drop us your ideas for topics you'd like us to discuss during the show. While you're at it, we'd love to hear your feedback about how you think we're doing, as well as any interesting theories you might have about what's going on in the Cosmere. You can send all questions and suggestions in a brief, concise email to Cosmere Studies at gmail.com, and we could read it as part of the show. Or if you'd prefer to spend, send us a physical letter, we have a P.O. Box at the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, P.O. Box 970063, or Muta 84097. So, Jordan, where can we find your work? Uh, you can find me at uh, youtube.com slash splice stream. It's funny that we brought up Al Rian at the end here because uh, I have just launched today the signups for... Uh, the professional amiibo league i host this once a year it's what i put the most effort into and so i could really use a signal boost on that so if you are willing to i put a uh, a community post there if you could go give that an upvote it'd be helpful but the reason i bring up alrien is i'm one of the amiibo i'm sending is named alrien uh it's a princess peach because it's a pink blonde and uh everything is centered around getting through your through. shields <laughs> um I was quite proud of it. And I actually, I finally got one of my viewers. They're starting to, uh, they're starting to read Mistborn. And so if you'd be willing to come join our community over there, I'd be appreciative because uh, I need more people to, you know, make people think Nurture this is this. cool and then Cultivate cross pollinate. Hmm. Uh, so, so come brainwash my community with me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So Bill, what about you? Uh, I have another podcast. It's with my friend Dylan. We talk about board games. We call the show The Innkeeper's Table, and we have new episodes come out every Friday morning. Most recently, we did another top three list. Our top three lists tend to be some of the more popular episodes. This time, we talked about dexterity games, so the ones where you're manipulating pieces directly, like the way you manipulate them as part of the game rather than just, I put my piece in this square. It's like, like balance Jenga. Jenga is kind of the the best example of a dexterity game but there were a whole bunch of them that we talked about uh six six new ones if you haven't uh played if you're not familiar with dexterity games you should check that out our next episode um is a mailbag episode where somebody wrote in and asked us how to deal with somebody alpha gaming where if you're playing a cooperative game, one person kind of steps up and says, okay, you go here, then you go here, and then I'll go here, and we'll win. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had an interesting discussion around that. Pretty cool. Lots of fun. You also check it out. That's good. Um, so my Facebook is Coincidence Cosplay and Props. My Twitter is at Coincidence Cosp because my name is too long. My Instagram is at Coincidence underscore Cosplay, and my TikTok is at coincidence cosplay, all one giant word. And my website is www.coincidencecosplay.com. Um, I am soon going to put my website at a different spot, but it'll still be the same URL. So I don't have to keep paying like $17 a month for not much going on on my website. Um, but I am hoping to soon do my D and D TikTok thing. I don't know how fast that'll go. Um, I have my Nazgul all done. I have to do, but I've, I've mostly been figuring out what my lineup is going to be for the conventions I have coming up. And so I'm keeping it lighter this year just because my arm is having to rest all the time. That was basically what the consensus is now with my arm is I have to rest it. Including Dragonsteel in November. I know I'm going to be at Dragonsteel. Uh, we, ha we have a nice uh, group of people who are already planning to be there. I know we're going to, we're going to do a meal or something. We're going to try and have some sort of meetup. We're not sure exactly yeah. when yeah. or where. So I'm working with you guys. Some of you know him if you're in the community modulus who he lives in the area, he's working with us. We're going to try and find something we can like go meet up and do. But part of that's going to, we're going to have to wait till we see our schedule. So mm -hmm. best way to keep up with that will be through our socials. Yes. Yep. And we will keep or by listening or continue to listening to the show. We'll talk about it there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, for those of you who want to support the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies but can't become patrons, we'd love it if you'd just let your friends know about the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to like and subscribe over on youtube.com slash Cosmere Studies. And if you want to toss us a good review wherever you listen to us, we'd appreciate that too. Also, head on over to store.streamelements.com slash Cosmere Studies to buy six merch. Um, any final thoughts, guys? I have one. Okay. But I'll let Brit Jordan go first. Well, I was going to say, when I grow up, I want to be Navani too. <laughs> I wonder if we could get Brandon's parents on the show. 
I mean, we almost got Isaac, so. <laughs> that was by accident. <laughs> no, just that's just one of those thoughts. Just like, how fascinating would that be? Would that be? Yeah. Oh no, parenting is hard, and it's nice to see writers who give parenting that respect. That it's like, no, it's not easy. Kids don't just magically. Oh, I did X Y Z, so they're gonna do the thing I want. No, they're they're people. They're gonna do what they're. I mean, gonna it's do. it's a problem you see in a lot of. Uh... I, th- I think especially in like television and serial series, you'll see the person who's like, I'm a cop and I'm working 24 seven yet. I'm also a stay at home parent. And it's like, where's the, where's the time? Like somehow Jack Bauer getting around Los Angeles in less than 20 minutes is less, is more realistic than this is. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. but no, like you said though, at the start, Brandon had some, has some flaws in the writing, but as, as it matures, he, he's definitely evolved. Mm-hmm. It'll be very interesting uh, since Brandon has this whole timeline that goes out till like year three thousand or whatever. Oh, you know, what what we get when Brandon starts becoming a grandpa? Oh man, that's gonna be crazy. It's a ways off. Um, special thanks to our patron producer, Mem's Laundry Service. This ain't your mama's laundry room. We get paid. <laughs> In addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. Next time, on August 29th, we'll be putting on our artsy hats and talking about the art of rhythm of war. Until then, though, on behalf of Bill, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening. And remember, there's there's always always another another secret. secret.